Stephen, what do you know about quantum mechanics? Well, I know just a little bit more now after the, our today's interview. Yep, we had Tillman Kubis online with us um, talking about quantum mechanics and waves. Yes, did a great job at kind of breaking it down. He, yeah. he, I, I, he made it seem so simple, which is so impressive. This is a good one to listen to. It do not be nervous and scared about quantum mechanics and, and uh, basically mechanical or not mechanical. Yeah, mechanical ways. Uh, yeah, mechanical yeah. ways. Uh, don't be don't be scared about that. He does an awesome job explaining it and breaking it down for us. It is relating to everyday life. Yes. So uh, pay attention towards the end of this one where he starts talking about birds, traffic jams, and everything else. It's a really good interview. We enjoyed this one. Joining us today on Superheroes of Science, we're so pleased to welcome Tillman Kubis, the Catherine Inge Pesich and Silvajo Research Assistant Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, there's so many things we want to talk to you about. <laughs> I, I know we did, we chatted with you there a week or so ago and uh, we wish we would just recorded our whole conversation and we were done. And uh, it's, uh, I. I had so many quotes that I was telling people across the day it's the, yeah. the, from our conversation the it was it was just awesome. And it all started with waves, right? The... Yeah, uh, well, I'm a many particle physicist by training, and that naturally comes with a lot of work on waves and then resonance is what should rather, one should rather say. So yeah, my work is predominantly on quantum mechanics, so you know, when you look at my funds or what I'm paid for, it's mainly working on semiconductor nanotechnology. Uh, when I was a student, I would have said this is the most boring possible topic you can find in physics, but man, I was wrong. <laughs> it's actually very exciting, very complex, and uh, yeah, it trains you a lot in many particle physics, and then actually once you learn that, you know that this is applicable on basically any system. What and if the wave, yeah, this could be indeed waves uh, of electrons, you know, plasmonic waves, I mean, electronic gases, that is. It could also be water waves, it could be even waves, gravitational waves in galaxies. So, this is all uh, in the domain of many particle physics. For at least a decade, I, I've heard the word quantum used a lot. Mm -hmm. And more and more, I'm hearing about like even quantum computing and stuff like that. What exactly, can you kind of explain for the simpler folks like myself, uh, what do we mean when we say quantum something? Gosh, this is a difficult question. <laughs> uh, well, again, I guess I could have given you good answers decades ago because I was like, you know, student trained and I believe that I really know what quantum mechanics is, or I believe that I would at least know which equations to tell you. Uh, in our days, I have to say, I don't quite see much of a difference between quantum mechanics and just classical wave mechanics. So I think that's the best answer to give. Quantum mechanics is wave mechanics. And um, yeah, what kind of waves? I mean, typically quantum mechanics is associated with something very tiny. Uh, this, when you ask layman, you will surely hear that. But uh, there is a beautiful law in physics it's called scale invariance. Uh, that basically tells that if you have a system um, that is just behaving similarly, but uh, like another system, but on different scales, like different length scales, and it's just behaving similarly. So if you take out the scales, you won't actually know which of the two systems you would look at. So if you have something tiny that doesn't qualify to anything, as long as you have a system that behaves with the same properties or the same interaction strengths, it behaves the same way. Okay. So I would say quantum mechanics is wave mechanics. Perfect. And you've been able to use this, this wave mechanics in the research that you do. Yeah, so the, um, the base behind that, uh, maybe I can share that. The base behind that is the propagator theory. So this will be, um, let me see if I can have a mouse pointer. So this seems to be a very abstract object. Um, typically, when you learn quantum mechanics, you will never see that. Most unfortunately, this is considered to be way too complicated. But um, uh, it's not. I mean, this is what I tried to tell you. Uh, this is basically the most beautiful object that you can define or you can find in, in many particle physics. 
at least in my opinion, is called the propagator. Uh, so this is a, a function often called G, which is defined here on two different uh, coordinate sets, like you know a time and a position in at, at, at two, so time t two, position two, uh, time t one, position one. And what do you do uh, here? Do you have a slide for this? No, sorry, yeah, do no. you see the slide? No, no, it's not been shared yet. Oh, okay. It does seem to share. It's very strange. Let me just see. Oh, I have to click share. There we go. I can see it now. There we okay. go. Let's try that again. Yes. Okay. I want to say, I, I know our uh, podcast people don't care. Uh, the audio podcast, they're, they're just listening, but yeah. the, with they're on YouTube. They'll kind of probably want to see what we're talking about. Okay, uh, well, so, I mean, I not to make this too long, I mean, this is a, such a very beautiful definition and that's why I really wanted to share it. Uh, this is actually, you could say, what got me extremely excited about, huh. well, I think it was in the year 2002, the first time uh, I had to apply this propagator theory or better to say, learn it. And uh, I was intrigued by its, its simplicity and generality. So again, that's why I tried to, to share that uh, excitement with anybody who wants to see it. Um, so ba basically what we define is a propagator. And with this propagator, this is this function G here, uh, one can define anything. One can de describe anything. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a function uh, that um, takes a system, which is usually described with some state but you know we don't need to worry about it. you could say the state here is something like the universe uh, we add a particle or an entity at the time t2 at the position x2 we take away an entity probably the same one that we just added at a different time t1 at a different position x1 and we basically ask whether the system is still in the same situation so you know it's like taking the universe adding something to it taking it away somewhere else, and then just seeing where the universe has changed. And uh, the only difficult part you could say is this T here that just makes sure we have uh, time ordering uh, in the system. So basically it has to make a difference whether we first add a particle and then take it away or whether we first take it away and then add the particle. But that's really more a formality. And as general as this uh, system is defined, as general is also the application space you can do. So the miracle in all of this is one can actually do very valid science and engineering with this. So I get paid for that work since, <laughs> yeah, since 2002, basically. And this and, is- uh, Yeah, so far this propagator theory is applied on transport of charge, spin, color charge, heat, quasi particles, anything you can find in uh, forefront uh, research, physics research. It's used in, in, mat in, in various materials, uh, even in nuclear fusion and fission, atom physics. So it spans a lot of different uh, uh, orders of magnitude or dimensions, like I mean, sizes. And yeah, I love this theory. And uh, basically, any kind of transport theory you can find can be deduced from that. So whether that's uh, you know, quantum mechanics, or whether that's a semi-classical or classical transport, uh, Newton, Newton's law, you can also deduce from that. So this uh, is something that's comparably recently found, like about 70 years ago, so recent at least for physics, but um, it's extremely powerful. And is it is it describing the location or describing the movement um, in a wave or, or it describes basically anything that the system would host. So if you look at a specific particle, then indeed it would uh, describe how that behaves. So I brought you here an example, maybe that's illustrative for this. Actually, this was provided by a, a great colleague, uh, Pavel Danielewicz in, in Michigan State University. Uh, so, you, you know, if he looked at uh, the collision of two double particles. So you could really say, you know, you have here this kind of merged billiard, billiard balls uh, that are colliding centrally. And he looked at cases where uh, you have high energy for the two particles, so you have a low energy. So let me try to, so this is here the case where you have a high energy. And now, uh, you know, you can see the evolution here with time of that collision. So mm -hmm. when, I, when I get back to this, so when you start here, 
you know, you could ask, is this now a particle or is it a wave? Right? Because it's not exactly sharp in its resolution, but you could say it's a very well resolved particle or two of those that you're colliding. And uh, you see here, there's a little correlation effect. So this is here like a double, uh, a two-dimensional position space because it's like position and correlation. But if you just look at how, what happens when the two particles collide or the two double particles collide, well, tell me at this, at this point, is that a particle or is it a wave? So what we unfortunately have often in quantum mechanic lectures or in, in the public discussion, you know, this confusion about duality of particle or uh, wave, well, it doesn't make much sense here, right? There is, there is any hybrid state in between uh, available as well. And that's where the beauty of, or the, 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 yeah, that's where the beauty of quantum mechanics really comes in, but also where you can draw a lot of uh, design work for, for modern devices. So that simple question, is it a particle or a wave is inappropriate. And uh, if you stick to it, you will actually tie your hands on your back because you, know, you can do so much more with the full nature of this stuff. And by the way, uh, the very same pair of particles, if you just give them a different energy, like a much smaller energy, then this here happens. We have a merging process. And again, you could say, well, it's a merged system, but is that now a particle or what is it? Right? I mean, there is, it's hard to define. I, and uh, I, this kind of work, so Pavel is working on a very different length scale than I'm working. I mean, he's a nuclear physicist, so he's at least working on high energy physics. So these length scales are femtometers, so they're extremely tiny. So these are uh, nuclei that are merging. But what, what we do in my team uh, at Purdue, well, we have, uh, we look, for instance, at light emitting dials. And this is one of many application spaces. We don't look at femtometers, but we look at nanometers, but that's a million times larger. So a very different scale, you would say. Um, uh, but because of scale invariance, we have very similar behavior. So what you see here is in position space and energy space, like before I had shown you different energy examples, but here, uh, you know, they have all given in the same frame because it's a stationary calculation. So time doesn't matter here. Um, you can see here areas where electrons behave like waves. So if that, you know, reminds you of waves that would hit the seashore, well, that's exactly what it does. <laughs> okay, only that these are electronic waves. Uh, you have it here on both cases, although this is upside down because these are kind of mirrored electrons, uh, like holes we call them. But uh, uh, what you can see here in the, I mean, here in the center here, there is these dots. So there you can clearly say where the electron package is. So we can answer like, there it is. So that is a clear indication it's a particle. Whereas in a wave case, you wouldn't be able to point to the particle. And then, yeah, just like before, we have here a big cloud on something that's in between, so hybrid things. Um, and that is very critical. So what happens here in these light emitting diodes, the electrons uh, and the holes, or the anti-electrons, if you like, they have to be trapped in locations, and then we have to wait and see that they recombine and emit light. So at some point, they will disappear. And of course, we want to have the light emitting diode emit light continuously. So we have to replenish those pockets of electrons from the sea of electrons. And that only works with something like hybrid states on top of that. So designing these LEDs uh, requires a very careful knowledge about the wave nature, the particle nature, like for those aspects here, and then those hybrid states in between. And, and this is really man-made customized. So we really need to have full control over all of this. And yeah, we use this every day. Like if you turn on an LED light bulb, then that's what you use. You create these traps, you have, you know, you conduct current. So it's, it's in our everyday life. It's unfortunate, however, most people don't realize how much quantum mechanics is in there and how easy quantum mechanics is. It's just waves. They can also trap water waves and have them bounce back and forth in your uh, uh, water cup, right? So this is exactly what happens with those electronic waves. They bounce back and forth in a tight cup. And in that sense, yeah, they are in there. So we can claim they're kind of uh, particles. 
that can be so overwhelming. I think sometimes when you're first learning about uh, the, you know, the waves and then the particles, and then is it behaving more like a wave or more like a particle? And then to see that here that there can be hybrid, you know, in, be in between places where it can kind right. of act like both. Um, but, that but can be know, a lot, I think. To... We're used to see that in our everyday life and we just don't realize it, it seems like. I tried to pick here an everyday example. Maybe people have seen uh, starlings uh, or starling clouds, you have this murmuration effect. So, you know, this is just a snapshot of such a cloud, but there's really nice videos on the web. Uh, this is not a static cloud, right? There's a lot of waves within that cloud, and it's an extremely efficient defense mechanism for those starlings when they're hunted by a hawk, for, let's say. And that's actually an, a, a, an example of such a starling cloud. It's hunted by a hawk. You can barely see it. It's where my pointer here is. And that hawk has a very hard time to, to hunt its, its prey because it's so hard for it to uh, focus on a single bird. And then hybrid modes uh, appear because that again is way more confusing, right? It's hard for the, for, the, for the hunter to predict where a starling will be. And just in this case here, it actually turned out that there is some uh, smaller groups of starlings separating. So we could say they are almost particle-like, so, you know, that's, yeah, this hybrid situation, I think we have most of the time. The extreme cases of pure waves or pure particles happen rather rarely in reality. I love that applied to yes. something. I mean, because it seems so high level. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you break it down. You're like, no, it's like birds are doing it. It's yeah. okay. Well, and I love that analogy that then the, the predator would have a difficult time trying to predict the exact spot where it would be. Wow, that is very powerful. Uh, I think then bringing that back to like an electron cloud, for example, if you're talking to students about where are those electrons? Well, um, now it's a real example and it's something found in nature that Right. It's easy, easy, better understood. Yeah, I think it's very important to, when, when you have a difficult question, you know, to address, you have to first really understand the question. What is a particle? How do you define something as a particle? Well, in physics, we would say it's something where we can clearly define a position. And then it automatically comes to the point, yeah, you will need to simplify it to a point. Otherwise, if it's elongated, yeah, which position do you take, right? And then for a wave, it would be, yeah, typically we would say it should have a clearly defined frequency or clearly defined momentum. But uh, in reality, there, we, we never have just a single pristine wave. Even if you play a guitar, you will have a superposition of a couple of other waves. Sometimes you like them. Sometimes you would say the guitar is mistuned. So, you know, where do we ever have just a particle or just a wave. That's, that's a great point. <laughs> I love that. I and it's when what when someone thinks, okay, it's he's talking like quantum mechanics, you right, know, right, right. wave mechanics. Mm -hmm. Wait, but that is such a high level, I could never understand that. But then I really like the fact that you can break it down to no, no, we have waves everywhere. Yeah. In, in yeah. our lives, there are waves all around us, and we we do see those and you just look at those and start thinking about how it would behave on a smaller, smaller, smaller scale. It, that is just, that's totally awesome. If you have a sound amplifier, if you listen to music, then it's the same story. You have a wave machine in there where you superimpose a lot of waves into hopefully something like a, a short sound package and that you will consider maybe a bang, but it's never really a sharp bang. So it's never an acoustic particle. But you would never just listen to a single wave. So again, this is another example. But of course, you can take water waves just the same way. Go to a pond, throw a stone in there. Yeah, you will have simple waves. But if you throw a couple of stones in there, you will get a wave interference. And you will probably even have standing waves somewhere. We could say, well, there's some sort of wave particle, right? or whatever you name it. We actually don't have a language for that. We would call it just a wave. In, in many particle physics, these are all resonances. And that's what we should actually consider them. These are resonances. We don't know the nature of them until we calculate them. Some might be more particle types, some might be more wave-like, but there's nothing to worry about. This is not, not a thing, this is not frightening at all. I mean, at least this is, that's how I perceive, perceive it. And, <laughs> and the rest is just math. I mean, uh, 
yeah, good, sure. I mean, if you want to calculate the details, or if you want to even uh, develop a simulation tool that uh, calculates these resonances, then you need to know your math. But you know, you can also just apply it. So there's a lot of uh, tools, uh, quantum mechanical tools, one would usually say on NanoHub, uh, free online version. So you can just click there, you know, open with a browser and you can run those tools and play with the resonances. And don't be frightened that they are quantum resonances, whatever that means. I mean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, there's, uh, I mean, there is also, there is, a, I think it's called the traffic simulator. Uh, if you Google for that, it's another simulation tool, many particle simulation tool uh, for uh, traffic waves or for traffic simulations. And they remarkably well resemble what happens in real life. So in that sense, every car driver is just yet another particle. And forget about the individualism, this doesn't work. This. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was hoping you were gonna mention something about the um, traffic jams because I thought, wow, that's another kind of like the birds, but in a different way. Can you uh, yeah. say a little more about? We have that also in human society. Um, sure, everyone is a little different. You know, Some drivers are on the phone, others are in, in, in a rush. But overall, all car drivers have uh, a similar desire, maybe to reach their destination, hopefully soon, without any trouble. And in that sense, you know, when you look at the average traffic behavior, then everyone is equal. Everyone is just a number in there. And yeah, there have been, I mean, I guess everyone had been in the traffic jam from time to time. And if you ever freaked out about someone in the front uh, creating a wave, you know, sometimes driving fast and then slow, well, then please click on the traffic simulator and you will see that these waves are inevitable. Uh, do they just happen if you have human drivers running them? Actually, they, I would even claim they would even happen with artificial intelligence driving the cars, but there the amplitude of the wave is way smaller. So it's basically insignificant. And yeah, there's a video, maybe one can post it as well. Uh, uh, I think it's broadcast, I mean, it's published by NSF. They uh, summarized some research results where exactly that happened. They looked at those waves, put an artificial intelligence driven car in the center of the, uh, the driving circle, and then the wave was basically disappearing. Well, again, given the measurement accuracy. Yeah, and I was oh, actually, I was watching that again this morning. In that video, it, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to look away from. Uh, because it, we can all feel that it, it, and yeah. you feel that driving it's i mean heck i drove here today and uh it went to hit the interstate you can feel that where it's people are surging and it's like who's up there doing that <laughs> and uh, then it's you look at the simulation there and it's like oh it's just it's just people closing gap and and mm -hmm. right so it's like oh it's so it's after we talked last time i know uh, that day when i drove home i'm like I, looking very carefully at my speed as I, I was as I was in rush hour trying to head up, up uh, down south to get home mm -hmm. and uh, it's like okay so how consistent am I being in this mm -hmm. so am I, am I contributing to it or am I dampening the wave and uh, I, I just never thought of my driving as a particle in a wave yeah 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 well yeah if once you realize that then you will have more patience at least I had more patience and you try to do something more well, I guess collective uh, conscious mm -hmm. or, so that, you know, the overall traffic will actually flow smoother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish we would also understand that social systems just behave the same way. So like, you know, yeah, when we are angry about something or we are, you know, maybe on social media sharing our frustration about something, well, what we are doing there is driving aggressively, so to say. And it would be actually better just for the overall traffic if we just, you know, cool down a little bit, maybe reflect a bit more about our own response to this and try to come to a reasonable uh, Facebook or whatever post. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like in nature, by the way, this just happens the same way. So if you have an atomic chain, you know, or actually a solid, so where atoms are tightly bond, mm -hmm. the atoms, of course, vibrate, they jump back and forth, and they hate that. They would like to be more on their sweet spots. So in a traffic case, you would say in your ideal dis distance to the next car. And yeah, they have to vibrate around that. So in that sense, again, it's another case of resonances you get there. Usually 
we call them heat waves or phonons or you know similar and um, but it's just the same way as in a traffic jam yes so that's See, the I, I love of, that i mean it, it's it, the thing of a scientist to think it, you your wave mechanics yeah. and your but you you can you think of that and you ingrain that so much that you then you start seeing the waves around you in right. patterns and people behavior and those are things that is, I never would have thought of. Well, and I, I think it just makes the whole concept of quantum mechanics in general just more accessible to everybody. <laughs> like, okay, the, I might it might might be a little intimidated by some of these formulas and things, but when I when I start to understand like the the traffic jam simulator or the birds or you know um, like you were saying those our responses in general to social media posts and things that that this is all the similar. And you know, there's many other concepts that I think intimidate um, students, at least I can tell from my own high school time that my physics teacher, excellent teacher, but when he had the option to, uh, you know, ignore the quantum mechanics topic and focus on others, he was happy to do so and he declared it also to us because he felt uncomfortable with quantum mechanics. You know, again, for the particle wave picture, but there's other things like tunneling. Right, so where would you have tunneling in, in, in real life? What do you actually have? Right, you just have to look at the right types of waves. So if you have, uh, yeah, water waves, you know, maybe in a pond, and maybe there is, uh, you know, a narrow, like there is maybe a shallow region in that pond. Yeah, it might be that the waves can barely make it through just because the the, the shallowness, right? But there's not enough water for that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a tunneling problem. So you would have surface waves that get reflected at that shallow place, and maybe some can actually make through, but it's unlikely. You know, that's it. That, there's nothing magic about a particle suddenly, you know, uh, beaming through something that it should never do. This is, no, this is much easier than that. It's not the particle in this case, it's the, the collective excitation that tunnels. And of course, you have the same actually with the sound waves. Like if you have, you know, uh, if you play music in your room and supposedly your walls should uh, confine the, the beats, uh, well, no, they are actually tunneling through the wall and they will create another sound wave in the next room. Mm -hmm. That's tunneling. So you know, <laughs> wow. there's nothing complicated about quantum mechanics. It's just unfortunate that people get so confused about apparent counterintuitive behavior. Well, I absolutely love the fact that you can break that down and, yeah. and show us that it's it's everywhere. And you can look at behaviors and wave behaviors in many, many different ways. Mm -hmm. And once yeah, you so get if, down to small there's enough- there's a student listening and the parents complain about loud music, well, here you have your answer. This is tunneling, you can't help it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, so this is what I consider my mission. Um, I try to distribute the knowledge. Many particle physics is just everywhere, literally everywhere. I don't think there's a single system that doesn't host many particle problems. And uh, yeah, I've been applying that on um, nano devices most of my time. So working a lot with semiconductor industry and of course colleagues in academia. And uh, yeah, now I'm expanding that to chemistry. Um, so they do apply, of course, quantum mechanics, but there is some beauty on the propagator theory that the Schrödinger equation, if that's a term, right, that people know, that doesn't cover that. It's only a, a small piece of quantum mechanics. There's actually more to it. And I mean, yeah, it's a bit difficult to explain that just in a few moments, but. Uh, it's basically about uncertainty. Uh, the Schrodinger equation gives very definite answers like uh, eigenvalues, like real numbers, what the energy of a particle or of a resonance would be. And that just never happens in true, in, in real life. You never have a definite answer. You have a more likely answer and you have some width around that. And it's just the same with, with the question, where is a particle? Yeah, you might get a most likely answer, but there's some uncertainty around it. That's not the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's just a measurement uncertainty, if you like. And, um, and that's what other equations can uh, come with quite easily and naturally. And, uh, and those are not so well known, unfortunately. 
So that's what I'm spreading. I try my best at least and provide tools. So my team and I, we are developing simulation tools for that. So it's a lot of computer work, a lot of patience and yeah, but it's very rewarding when you see the tools being used by not only academic colleagues, but also industrial ones. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. also, I it, remember it, when I, um, you know, when I was just about to do a master's or actually diploma thesis. So this was uh, in for the physics physics uh, students in, in Germany at that time, the final, you know, the final year of the studying uh, until of course you would uh, uh, do a PhD. And uh, I was really nervous about whether I would be fit to do theory. So I asked my, well, to be a master mentor or master host, a master advisor, I'm sorry. I asked him what what uh, prerequisites do I have to come with to, to do a you know theory a master thesis with him, and I was really expecting like oh we have to know second quantization, advanced quantum mechanics, solid state theory, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And now he said yeah you just have to have enough patience, <laughs> just patience. Oh he was right. It takes a lot of patience, but once you're there, then it's great. <laughs> well. That's really cool that you're, you know, you're expecting all that, you know, oh, am I going to be prepared and I'm, am I going to have all these? No, just patience. <laughs> you're never prepared in the sense that you would, you know, start a research project and just work on it and, you know, get it done in a predefined and, and uh, you know, well-known way. This is not a, the this is not then research. This is just, uh, I don't know development maybe, but even that is, is not the right word because development also requires hitting obstacles and issues that you have to solve somehow and no one has solved them before. So that's actually the exciting part of, of uh, research and development. You have to solve problems that no one before you has solved. Wow. Now the question is of course, why hasn't been it, it been solved? Hopefully because it was just too difficult um, the worst case would be because no one cared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that that would be a bad thing. So you know, if you want to have a, a general advice on, on what to study, apart from of course whatever excites you is great, but uh, try to find the hard problems that really bother mankind, that is important for society, and uh, and really a lot of people think about. Then. That's usually a good spot. And of course, then once you're in there, try to apply methods that no one thought about. Right. That's then also a good way, usually. I like that. I do too. Well, that's good. I like yeah. That. <laughs> Tackle the hard problems. Look at the hard yeah. problems if you want to make a difference and an impact, mm -hmm. something new. I but love do that. It, do it a different way. That's, that's important. And that's what I hope for with my contribution, maybe to quantum chemistry or many other fields. The methods are actually there, so I don't need to invent them. I mean, you know, many particle methods, they're not that well known and sometimes they need, you know, some adaption to it. So there's, you, you need to know your tools. But um, I think this happened quite often in, in research. There were often breakthroughs coming uh, in because a known method in a different field was repurposed in a new field. Oh. If, if you take uh, Einstein's general relativity theory, well, that was actually known in math science, you know, the, the geometry of, uh, of uh, spaces that are, you know, non straight, or I'm not sure what the English term would be, but like, you know, twisted or warped uh, geometries or matrix, uh, that was a well known, uh, not well known, it was a well, it was a known enough um, concept in math science. And Einstein did the smart thing and reapplied that to well, space time. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I like and I and I like that. I think yeah, we have a lot of really good theories there right now. It's you know, use what's there, use what's there and, and look right. at it from a different starting point. And that's the nice part about interdisciplinary research. I have the opportunity to do this and I really enjoy that since many years. Uh, the, the most difficult part of that is actually the finding the right language because every department has its own terminology. If you say resonance uh, to physicists, they understand something else than when you talk to a chemist or when you talk to maybe a mechanical engineer. So yeah, that, that takes time, but 
nothing comes for free. And well, we find that even like in teacher workshops. Right. And so you'll have one teacher teaching right beside someone else, the same exact concept, but they're using different terminology. Mm -hmm. And one of our things is find that common language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, find that common right. language with each other. So yeah, that's because uh, Sarah's had students, right? Yeah, uh, that will come to her and oh, we've never done no, this. No, yeah, we never, never made a um, what is a scatter plot. We've, we've we've never seen a scatter plot. Yeah, you have. Mm -hmm. You see, <laughs> you know, they're just they're doing it. You know, you you see it different in math class, but it's the same. And yeah. So it's yeah that that but I think that gets us hung up often. Yeah. Well, I loved, I, I, you make it sound so much simpler than it really is. Well, I, I know it can't be as simple as you make it sound, but uh, I do love, yeah, he's like, yeah, it is, that is. <laughs> yeah, just a few things, you know? Well, see, there is, even for those that are still uh, frightened about it, there is so many simulation tools out there. Mm -hmm. And then once you play with that, you realize it is simple. And you can always find intuitive not counterintuitive intuitive similarities in your everyday world so it's it's just a matter of okay play with it you know get the experience and everything else comes naturally i love that i love that thank you so much for this is that thank it thank you for i, would oh say, I want to say breaking it down but since we're talking yeah. about particle things i don't know if i, I should make sure <laughs> that in. but uh but but thank you for the analogies and mm -hmm. thank you for helping us see that, that, that literally there are waves everywhere and you can take your research and you can apply it big to something like uh, cars on interstate or so waves through social media, mm -hmm. or you can bring it all the way down to see what's happening within a, a LED, a light, light emitting diode. Yeah. If I may just add that, I mean, uh, we have that often as a technical challenge, challenge within you know quantum transport simulations, um, you know, even just for the computers, it can be a hard time to solve the equations if they're formulated in a too complicated way. And it is then uh, up to us scientists to find a better formulation. Um, so I would say in general, if mankind faces questions that are terribly difficult that have kept us occupied for hundreds of years probably, uh, it's really time to rethink how to formulate the question formulated in a more efficient way and the answer will be very obvious. That, what I'm just saying is, uh, was something I actually recall in my first physics theory class. I think that was in the year 1999 or something. I mean, I remember it was a, a theoretical uh, mechanics. So, you know, again, very first theory class and we were all frightened because uh, we had to find in our exams or also homework assignments, of course, we had to find what they call canonical variables. Well, again, big term, right? But what does it mean? It was just the, the way to define your question in the most efficient way. And we learned at that time, if you don't find your canonical variables, then you won't be able to solve the actual equation because it will be way too complicated. Yeah, true, right? And the same we have in quantum transport if we don't formulate the equations in the right way. So like take a guitar string, if we uh, model that in atomic resolution, it will take a ton of CPU hours to solve the vibrational modes of that. But once we, you know, or how to, to solve how it sounds, how it interacts maybe with the air surrounding the guitar string. But if we transform that question into the natural modes of the guitar string, then it's really a, I don't know, a three by three matrix. It's an extremely simple system you can solve by hand. And that's, again, because of scale invariance, because of, you know, quantum transport problems are everywhere, or if you like many particle problems are everywhere that statement find your canonical variables i think this is true for any problem mankind faces so you know instead of trying desperately to find an answer first find the canonical variables then the answer is easy and that's a very different problem right to find a better formulation for your question instead of the solution and i love that and i think that ties so nicely into just the scientific process in general just if you're not if you've been asking these questions and you're not getting anywhere Think about it differently. Come up with a different way to ask the question. I mean, that's this. That is awesome. Yeah. I believe even Einstein 
I recall I made a, a quote on, on him years ago in a, in a presentation regarding actually the same problem. And I, he, he said something like, make, uh, make everything as simple as possible, but not any simpler. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to go too far. <laughs> but, I love that. Yeah, there is people that make problems even simpler than they are supposed to be. So just yeah. as a line. This can still happen. And yeah, we can find them in science just, just the same way. And that's then always a pity to see them talk about nonsense results. Great. Oh, oh my that. goodness. Well, well, that was perfect. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today and, and, and talking about these.